All right, welcome back to Inside.com. Here we are with Inside Podcasting. I'm your host, Chris Hashi. Today, we're joined by David Plotz, the CEO of CityCast and a co-host of Slate's Political Gap Fest. David, thanks so much for joining us today. Nice to be here, Chris. Uh, David, if you could just please um, explain your current role as the CEO of CityCast. CityCast is a company that uh, I started in 2021. I'm trying to remember when we started, 2021. And it is a very new kind of company. We're doing daily local podcasts in cities across the U.S. Daily local local news-focused podcasts, I should note. And we're coupling those with daily local newsletters. So we're now in 11 cities. And in each of those cities, we have a morning podcast called CityCast Denver, CityCast Boise, CityCast Philly, uh, and then a daily morning newsletter called Hey Denver, Hey Philly, uh, Hey Houston. And uh, we're trying to help people feel more connected to their city and give them the tools to be more connected to their city. So if you think of what the daily is doing at a national and international level with a morning sort of single conversation about something that matters in the world today, we're trying to do the same thing, but for the cities where we where we're located. And it's going really well, it's really fun and challenging, uh, but the audiences are building and uh, and we think it's uh, we think we think it's going to work. That's awesome. Um, so what led to, you said it started 2021, what led to the beginning of, of CityCast? Uh, CityCast started, grew out of a conversation I had with Tim O'Shaughnessy, who's the CEO of our parent company. So we're owned by a company called Graham Holdings, which you may know as the company that used to be the Washington Post company. But the, mm-hmm. the family that owned the Washington Post, the Graham family, sold the Post to Jeff Bezos about 10 years ago, but they still uh, had, had built a huge other uh, huge sort of uh, multivariate conglomerate uh, where they own Kaplan, the for-profit education company. They own my old employer, Slate. They own Framebridge, the online framing company. Uh, and they have they have a long history in media and in local media and in podcasting. So, so Graham Holdings also uh, original was the incubator of Megaphone, which it sold to Spotify. It was the largest investor in Gimlet. Uh, before it went to Spotify. And and Tim and I were talking and Tim was saying, you know, why is it that podcasting, which has been so successful in so many areas of traditional audio, hasn't really broken into local news? Why is it, why are there not local news podcasts the way there are podcasts about uh, sports, about uh, science, about uh, international affairs, every other area where audio had had been successful, there were podcasts, but in local news, not so much. And we thought maybe there's a real opportunity here. And so we've set out to to fill that void and and do it better and do it first. I mean, but when you think about it, you know, you're you're trying to get local news, you're either going to go to your, you know, maybe a local, I mean, some some people will go to a local newspaper, some people go to a local website, you turn on the news, that's about as local as you're going to find. It's hard to bring those with you, so I, I feel like that's definitely was a home run thought of you know, hey, how can I get my news even on the go about my local city? Now, CityCast is in eleven cities right now. Are there plans to expand? Yeah, we'll be expanding to a couple more cities uh, in the next few months, and the plan is to be in a lot more cities. the The goal is if we can make it work, we think we can make it work in many, many kinds of cities. I think probably we'll focus on on cities that are growing, cities that are uh, probably mid, we're having a harder time in the very large cities. So we may focus more on mid-sized cities, mm-hmm. um, by which I mean, not the sort of less the the, the top five cities and more the, the cities five to 75. Um, and yeah, and, and the idea, yeah, I think one one point I'd like to emphasize is that while we're a podcast that is focused on local news, it isn't actually news in the way that radio is news. When you're listening to the local radio and they tell you the traffic or the weather, you know you're hearing that at that moment 
And that traffic is happening now or whenever it was the traffic reporter saw it three minutes ago. And that weather is now. But when someone's listening to a podcast, you have no idea when they're going to listen to it. Mm -hmm. And we've actually found that more than half or about half of our listening occurs more than 24 hours after the podcast drops. And so it can't function as news in the sense of we're giving you urgent up to the minute information that you can act on. It's news in the sense that it's giving you important, relevant timely information about the city that will affect how you see it but it's not it doesn't it doesn't tell you oh i should avoid taking 295 now because it's backed up or it doesn't tell you oh there's a storm coming and so i better uh you know better better bring in the the uh the clothes that are drying on the line it's much more um it's much less utilitarian news and more about making you feel connected to your city today now, speaking to that, you know, how do you go about or you know, how, does, how, does, how do teams go about using what stories are right for each uh, newsletter and episode? Well, we think of the newsletter and the podcast. So the newsletter actually has much bigger audiences right now in the podcast. It's much easier to get people to read newsletters, as you guys know. Um, nice. Great. You know, it's a great new medium, a great, well, great old medium, but great. Uh, it's a great medium. Um, and the podcasts have, have smaller audiences. But we think of the the newsletter as being the, your toolkit for being a great citizen. You, the newsletter is, it's got all the headlines you need, but it's also got information that you need just to function better as a, as a Denverite, to function better as a Las Vegan. So it will have events you can go to. It will have, um, but also civic explainers. Say, for example, I got, I got prescribed a bunch of oxycodone for some surgery a while ago. And I was like, what do I didn't use it? So what do I do with my oxycodone? So there might have an explainer in the newsletter. It's like, what do you do with your medicine that you don't want to use? Cause you're not supposed to flush it down the toilet. Uh, or, uh, how do I get a residential parking permit? And so the, the newsletter function as, as a, as a toolkit for the day and the new, the podcast functions as, let me back up. Podcasting is an amazing emotional medium. It's not a great informational medium. If you wanted to learn about the city budget of Denver, it would be very bad to learn about it from a podcast because someone, mm -hmm. the host would start to say, and we spent, uh, the city spent $37 million on buses this year, and the police pension was $47 million, it's expected to rise to 58 point. And like by the, it's just impossible yeah. to follow that in a podcast form. It's, it's not a great informational medium. But it's an amazing medium for emotion and connection. So with the podcast, we really focus on stories that give people a way to feel more deeply about the city. So it might be a very opinionated take on the food of the city. So something about like, what is the best donut in, what is the best donut in Houston? And that's something which people get really emotional and passionate about. Um, it's not timely news in the same way, but it's, it's, it makes you feel more connected to Houston. Or if it is a very newsy story, uh, there's a controversy where I live in Washington, DC about a bike lane that people want to put down this main street right in front of my house here. Yeah. And there's massive disagreement on both sides. It, we had a great conversation between someone who really wants this bike lane, someone who opposes it. And it was a way, it, it, it wasn't news in the sense it didn't tell you the city council is doing X because the, that headline might come later or might have already come. But what it did is it gave you the context about how different sides of this issue, people on different sides of this issue are thinking about it and talking about it and talking to each other about it. And so we think of the, the podcast as really serving as an emotional anchor for people who are living in a city, a way to to you certainly be educated more about it, but to be educated in a way that makes them feel more deeply about it. Now you're, you know, you're somebody who has been in media for, for quite some time. How exactly did you get into journalism and, and media? Uh, I got it. I, I did college during, I did high school. I worked in my high school newspaper and then my college newspaper. And then I thought I was going to be a lawyer and I was working as a paralegal right after college. And I loathed it and realized, you know, the thing that I had loved doing was, was, journalism. And so I ended up getting a job at the local alternative weekly here in DC, the Washington city paper, which, uh, was an incredible incubator, it had amazing editors, David Carr, 
Uh, I was David Carr's deputy, Jack Schaefer before David. Jack hired me, two of the greatest editors you know, you can imagine and yeah. learned about covering cities, covering local government from them. And then when Slate launched back in 1996, I had never been on the internet. I didn't know what the web was, but I thought, A, the person founding it, Mike Kinsley, was one of my heroes, and B, it's a new medium and just seemed really exciting. So I was one of the first handful of employees at Slate when we launched and have actually been associated with it ever since uh, in one way or another. Sure. Um, speaking of that, you know, you are the co-host of Slate uh, Political Gap Fest. Um, you know, what is your favorite part about hosting a podcast? Specifically that podcast, I should say. I guess my favorite part about specifically hosting that podcast is for those of your readers and listeners who don't know, it's a weekly political conversation between me and Emily Bazelon of the New York Times and John Dickerson of CBS News. Uh, we all used to work together at Slate, and we, we've we been doing this same conversation for 17 years. So it is, if not the oldest, it's, it's one of the handful of oldest podcasts around and with the same set of people. And I think what I love about it is that I get to sit down with two of my best friends every week and just hang out. And honestly, Slate does pay me to do it, but I probably would do it if they didn't pay me. Um, and certainly as a form of emotional gratification, of emotional connection and of of staying humanly connected to people I love, it's been incredible. And it's also built relationships for me across the world. I, I've traveled to places and met people who are Gap Best fans, who, who've, I've had meals with, who have introduced me to other places, who've um, shown me shown me how their communities work and that that ability to have an emotional connection with fans uh and listeners is incredible I, I actually think not to digress here but some of the most profound moments of my life as a journalist have been with when i have either usually by chance just met someone who was a gab fest listener and they've explained to me the um, the kind of emotional connection they have to me and to John and to Emily and all these people. It's it is really humbling and and wonderful to think that a conversation that you've had with two friends that other people have been listening in on has has affected and changed how other people think about the world, how they live in the world, has built an emotional bridge to them between me and them. And I fucking love it, love it. It's great. It's the in me. I don't need to tell you this. You're you're you know you write about podcasts. We're here, uh, you know, talking to each other in a podcast like fashion. It is the podcast is the most emotionally connecting medium that has ever been devised. It's wonderful. It really is. And it's it's funny to think that like these are conversations you had in a newsroom years ago, and you just kind of were able to translate them to a medium. And share them more with other people. And it is amazing to think about how how well that can connect with people. And speaking of the podcast, just as a medium in, in general, over your time, what do you think has been the biggest change in the podcasting industry? Gosh, that's a hard question because as we just discussed, I've been podcasting since the dawn. We started doing the GabFest the year the word podcast was coined. Mm -hmm. um, so it, I've seen it all. Um I mean, I loved the explosion of really ambitious, deeply reported, very creative kinds of podcasts. And of course, you know, Serial being Exhibit A, but there were so many others and so many different kinds. I love that. Um, and I'm kind of sad that that uh, that firework seems to have uh, turned to ashes and there's so much less of it. I I don't. I understand why there are so many similar true crime podcasts and understand why there are so many celebrity podcasts. I get it. I, the economics make sense. And certainly the podcasts that I've been associated with are on the cheap end of production because it's so much easier to do it and you can do more of them faster, cheaper, and the audiences come to them. I thought the, the kind of depth of ambition in those, in those big swings was amazing and wonderful. And, I kind of miss that the, the market can't sustain that for now. I'm sure they'll be back in some fashion. I mean, the the oversaturation, it, it felt like 2020, 2021, all of a sudden there was 
hundreds of podcasts that were kind of similar. I mean, I just think about things that I listen to. Like uh, every week I like to listen to a podcast or two about the New York Giants, my favorite football team. Now there's 40 podcasts about the Giants and they're all going to say similar similar things about how the team's not playing well. Um, so, you know, it's the, kind of that oversaturation. At least you're not listening to New York Jets podcast. Yeah, thank God. Yes, thank God. <laughs> At least it, not that. Thank God, yeah. Um, it, yeah, it, I totally understand what you're saying about that. Um, it's just nowadays it feels like almost anybody um, can have one and you do miss that general connection you might have with a specific topic that only one thing is covered. Speaking of topics, though, you know, you host a political show. Um, is that the kind of podcast you generally like to listen to? Or what's your favorite kind of genre of podcast you like to listen to? I do not like to listen to them at all. Okay. Uh, I don't, I am not even that interested in politics anymore. It's been so disheartening to be a political journalist and a Washingtonian over low these many years. And mm -hmm. one reason why I ended up, I left Slate and went and moved to Atlas Obscura, which is a, a travel and media company all about the wonders of the world mm -hmm. uh, was because I just couldn't stomach what was going on in American politics and the, and I didn't, I never really liked the journalism. So, so I love hosting the Gap Fest. I love talking to John and Emily about politics. It gives me just enough of the fill that I want, but I am not actually interested in it as a topic. Um, I listen to a ton of soccer podcasts. So I, there's a, a guardian podcast called football weekly which is they put out i don't know so many ep episodes a week it's called weekly but there's like three a week and i listen to that theologically i listen to citycast um in all the cities for mm -hmm. professionally but i listen to citycast dc in the city where i live for pleasure because it it just gives me such a deeper connection to my city um and and then i listen to uh i listen to 99 invisible uh, which I love. I listen to some food podcasts. Um, and, and then every so often someone comes and tells me, oh, there's a great new, there's a great new, uh, series you have to listen to and I'll go listen to that. Oh, and I listen to, I mean, I think one podcast that I adore and it's admittedly it's by a very close friend of mine, but I think it's a genius podcast It's called one year. And it's a podcast, which just tells a bunch of stories about one year in american life and so this season it's 1955 they've done uh 1942 they did 1995 and it just finds half a dozen stories tells them each over an hour six episodes and they are so interesting the 1955 there's an episode about this you know little league all black little league team from charleston south carolina that tried to get to the little league world series and how an appallingly they were treated by everybody along the way um so i, I think that's an incredible show i just it's funny i just wrote about that in one of our newsletters uh like last week or the week before highlighting that exact episode so that's very oh, funny that you brought that up good it's so good so good it was so fascinating and i love that idea of just taking one year because i mean a lot of listeners of podcasts um are a lot younger than would have been around in 1955. This is a brand new story to them, or even really uh, being able to embrace themselves in culture and history that they may not know about. So I love that idea. And that's, that's amazing that you brought that up. Um, last question for me. If somebody's going to start a new podcast, which we just talked about, you know, there's a lot of podcasts out there. What do you think they need to do to be successful? I mean, we kind of talked about it. Do you, do you think that it's the most important thing is just to kind of find a way to be unique? This is sound really mundane. You have to make sure it sounds okay. Like mm. So many podcasts that people have an idea for, just the audio quality is crummy and people just not listen. Like they will not listen to your podcast no matter how cool it is if the audio quality is crummy. So just invest in the time to learn how to make a podcast sound decent. So that's, that's the threshold. Beyond that, if you're not a famous person, if you're not a famous person and if you're a famous person, you can do whatever the fuck you want because people will listen to you. But if you're not a famous person, I think it, it it's very much about finding the area in which you, which you are just more weird and idiosyncratic and more interesting or more curious than anybody else is. So mm -hmm. I don't know that it matters really what you're going to do, but I would, I would definitely lean into the, the weirder idea, the idea that seems 
that seems insane like you know going do to you know doing a podcast about every every single popsicle stand in in the city of uh dubuque uh <laughs> maybe that's a, maybe that's a great pod it's more likely to be a good podcast than your thoughts on true crime in dubuque like that i'll put it that way like the the the, the weirder and more idiosyncratic it is the more chance it has of finding First of all, it will find a niche audience. And then second of all, it might just break out because people will be so taken by the fact that you're interested. I get a long way, of, long, very long way of saying it. Like the most important thing in a podcast is that the host actually seem interested in it. Yeah. Like the, where the podcasts suffer is when post, hosts just don't seem to care. But it, a host, if a host is interested, if a host is like curious about it, who the fuck cares what it's about? It's so great. Mm -hmm. So that's that's what matters. It's, it's it'll suck in the audience no matter what i totally agree with you uh david thank you so much for joining us here on inside.com it's a real pleasure to have you it was my pleasure chris thank you <laughs>